morning, everyone. Welcome to the first session of the Valencia College Sustainability Conference. We are so excited to be here with you all. We've got a great schedule, a great lineup. Um, so we will go ahead and get started. And if I can just make sure that you guys can see my screen. Perfect, great. So today is the first day. Um, our session is running from today through Thursday, and it's all virtual and all free. So we are excited to have you. Um, I'm Carrie Black. I'm the Director of Energy Conservation and Sustainability here at Valencia. Um, and we are just so thrilled uh, to be here with you all. And I'm excited to be hosting today's session. So just as a note, we are recording today's session. We're recording the entire conference um, and the sessions will be available on our YouTube channel um, after the conference. And um, for our Valencia students, uh, for each session that you attend, you will be entered into a drawing for prizes at the end of the conference. Um, these are gonna be including uh, stasher bags, portable solar chargers, or even an iPad. So the more sessions that you attend, the greater your chances of winning. Um, and you must be an actively uh, enrolled Valencia student to win. So a little bit about uh, Valencia's sustainability. We are, um, we seek to promote and execute Sorry about that. Hey, um, so a little bit about Valencia's uh, sustainability mission and vision. So we seek to promote and execute operational practices in the service of environmental, economic, and social responsibility for current and future generations while effectively communicating and educating about the significance of these practices for people and the planet. And our vision is to serve as a sustainability role model in our community. And kind of a way to summarize all of this is with uh, the concept of the triple bottom line, uh, which emphasizes measuring success in three areas. So environmental, economic, and social responsibility. Or put another way, people, planet, and prosperity, which is the theme of the conference this year. So our Office of Sustainability really focuses on the operations of the college and making sure that we are working in a sustainable way and really working to reduce our carbon footprint. So the areas that we, the general kind of bigger areas that we touch um, include waste and recycling, uh, energy and water conservation, transportation, grounds and food. So we really uh, reach into all the different areas um, and operations of the college. And we are thrilled to be celebrating our 10 year anniversary um, of the Office of Sustainability and doing so by putting on this conference. Uh, the Office of Sustainability was created in the fall of 2011 with the hiring of the first sustainability director, Dr. Deborah Green, who was an environmental science faculty member at Valencia. And over the years, Valencia has accomplished many things within sustainability, having gone from one green certified building to now 12. Uh, we've improved and expanded recycling college-wide, including winning recycling competitions, several in fact, as well as we've increased our energy efficiency, saving millions of dollars through both mechanical and behavior changes. And these are just of the, a few of the things that we've done in the 10 years. But none of this could have been accomplished without the support of our students, faculty, and staff. And we want to thank each and every one of you who's been involved uh, with sustainability, whether it was 10 years ago or sometime along our journey to today. So thank you. So we've had 10 great years, but what's, what's in the... Uh, store for us for the next 10 years and beyond. So the big three objectives that the office is working on, um, we are working towards obtaining carbon neutrality by 2050. We also want to uh, reduce the waste that the college generates. And then we also want to improve uh, our water conservation and stormwater management. And our largest goal is indeed the carbon neutrality um, and it encompasses energy efficiency, 
and energy conservation, moving to renewables, and then also addressing our transportation related emissions. So we've got our work cut out for us. And in order to be successful and accomplish these goals, we need your help. Um, and there are numerous ways to get involved. You can join a student club or get connected with SGA and the SGA officers uh, at your campus. Uh, there's also opportunities to become food waste champions to assist with our food waste recycling education on our East and West campuses. Uh, you can also join our Tree Campus Higher Education Committee, helping provide input to our tree care and plantings. And we also encourage you to keep up to date with all the opportunities that uh, come along um, by following us on social media and our uh, links are there. And you can also reach out to us directly at sustainability at valenciacollege.edu to find out more. And now it is my pleasure to be introducing today's um, presenter, Professor Kevin Chow. Uh, professor Chow is a professor of earth science here at Valencia on the West Campus. His research focus is on the chemistry of magmas and lavas. And, and in grad school, he got to melt rocks and work with the lava, super cool. Um, however, he's curious and passionate about all aspects of earth and science in general. His hobbies include photography, you should definitely follow him on Instagram, uh, also building and making things and fun nerdy stuff like Star Wars, Star Trek, and comic book movies. Uh, he's always up for talking about science, current events, and of course, Star Wars, Star Trek, and comic book movies. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Professor Chow. Thanks, Gary. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for stopping by. Um, screen here. There we go. Can everyone see that? Right, yes. Good. So again, my name is Kevin Chow. I teach earth science at West Campus. Uh, the goal of this talk is going to be giving some basics on sustainability, some background definitions, uh, but also into get into the reasons why we need. So as an earth scientist, I'm going to be talking a lot about climate. So the structure of the talk is going to be broken into three parts. The first is basics of sustainability, backgrounds and definitions. Second is going to be the science of climate. And this is going to be kind of the meat of the talk. Uh, we're going to break down what we know and the consequences of inaction, which sounds kind of dramatic. And then what do we do? Realistic steps we can take. So what is sustainability? That's right in the title. The original definition actually goes back to our ancestors. It's the use and management of resources in ways that do not deplete them so they don't burn out. It's a very basic outlook because it comes from farming, from logging, right? So people hundreds of years ago kind of figured out that if you use too much now, there won't be that much later. Right? So some examples are forestry. Don't cut down too many trees or there won't be that many trees for next year. Water management is another example. If you pump out too much water from aquifer layers, sometimes those aquifers don't have time to recharge and there won't be enough water down the road. And even food, good land management, so you don't deplete too many nutrients from the soils and therefore you can keep using that soil for farming. Some examples of what sustainability does not look like. Uh, there's some pretty severe examples of deforestation in Papua and Brazil, that's the satellite picture showing before and after. Um, and that's the wrong way to do logging because when you strip all of the vegetation, nothing is gonna grow back. As far as agriculture, this is a photo from the Dust Bowl in the 30s. Uh, in the Midwest, the farming practices that they used at the time strip nutrients from the topsoil layers. And uh, I, I think they didn't know better at the time, but they quickly found out this is the consequence of that. And that led to just not, not just infertile soil, but these massive dust storms that would sometimes blow across the country. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about when I say kind of the, the old view of sustainability, where it's just manage things so it doesn't get bad. Modern usage of the term reflects our greater awareness of the balance of nature and ecosystems, right? We know a lot more now than our ancestors did. So 
As a result, in 1983, the United, me, the United Nations established the Brentwood Commission. And this was in response to the trends they were seeing in uh, poverty, food availability, availability, and environmental factors. Uh, pollution, acid rain, ozone depletion, these were things that were coming to the forefront at the time. And they realized that there was a call to do something about it. So the goals of the commission included cooperation on issues like sustainable development and these environmental concerns. And there was a big focus on international cooperation. The, the idea was that we all had to get in on this. It wasn't just a few countries here and there. And the product of the commission was the publication of Our Common Future in 1987. And this is where they laid out the results of their study and came up with some goals. But the big takeaway was the definition of the term sustainable development, which, I quote, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So there's two parts to that. One is the acknowledgement that yes, we do need to meet our needs, that can't change, but we need to figure out a way to do that without compromising future generations ability to do the same. And the focus here was generational and that's something that I'll come back to a little later. But it included awareness of environmental and ecological considerations. So what I want to do now is have some breakout rooms before I get into the actual science of the climate part. And I want you all to think about what have you seen or heard recently, in the news, online, <clears throat> that has indicated a need for sustainable development. I kind of want to gauge awareness right now. So Carrie, if you can help me set that up. Yes, okay. So we're going to break you all up into um, breakout sessions and you'll have about five to six minutes. Is that correct, Professor Chow? Sounds good. Perfect. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start sending those out now. What did you come up with? Who wants to volunteer from, from some of the groups? Well, I'll, I'll break the ice. I'm um, Professor Nicole Valentino, and my group uh, sort of focused on uh, some of the the plastics that are just not sustainable. And uh, I was sharing how one California group is suing several of the largest manufacturers of our products for polluting the earth because they know full well we can't recycle plastics no matter how much they say that it's our fault as consumers that we're not doing our due diligence and recycling them. And uh, it, it says a lot about mass, mass production and alternative materials that are biodegradable and yet we're not seeing them being mass produced yet. Uh, it's interesting to see if this lawsuit actually goes anywhere. It has gone up um, in California, but you know, we need more choices for recycling. You know, we need to ask publics why they're not helping the city of Orlando meet their sustainability goal of zero landfill by 2040. We need, we need community effort, but we need the, um, we need the options. No, oh, that's very true. Anyone else have something they want to add? I feel like I'm in class, ask a question and everyone tries to avoid eye contact. Well, I'll say one more thing. Um, yeah. It's the first annual, you know, inaugural uh, sustainability conference at our college. And uh, some, sometimes I feel like this should have been the 20th year, but I'm really happy that this is the first and we're bringing together our community, our, our, our political leaders, our, our college leaders, our students to, to, to learn about what we're doing in Central Florida at a local level. And uh, thank you, uh, Kevin, for being here and, and sharing with us. And uh, my colleague, Karen, has uh, something to say. Karen? Karen? Maybe not. Well, see, there's another hand raised. Andy Ray. Hi. Uh, you're muted. Andy. 
Any, did you have something to add or? Andy, can you put your comment in the chat and I will read it? There we go. I okay. can unmute Thank myself. You. Okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add that um, uh, I think it's great that we're having this conference. I just wanted to point out that uh, sustainability at Valencia started with Helen Wazell back in 2005. And we started a committee, um, had uh, several uh, faculty and staff, uh, Larry Rosen, who was responsible for increasing the water quality of Lake Pamela on West Campus. Um, and then um, we had a master plan of West Campus uh, done by Gladding Jackson and a bunch of the faculty, uh, Dr. Deb Hall and Jerry Reed and Brenda Schumpert and, and myself um, started uh, endowed share program uh, to, to do things like bat houses and birdhouse and, and uh, outdoor classroom and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, this uh, with it, you can't mention the sustainability without also, you know, uh, Dr. Deb. Um, Deborah Green and uh, Patty Riva and Resham Shirsat uh, that all have been very responsible. Uh, and then we're, we're, it's wonderful that uh, Carrie has, has picked up this uh, uh, torch and really run with it and done some great stuff uh, over the last you know, years that she's been here. So some fantastic things for sustainability. Thank you. Oh, uh, Stephanie? Good morning. Um, yes, uh, my group was talking about how we can't see any more like orange trees here in in Orlando, and also um, how much deforestation there has been to be able to build even more houses or like um, businesses, and how we've seen in certain areas where like there's more and less animals also, and we were also wondering if like there's like a law that helps sustainability, especially with little with small businesses and with big businesses to like protect the environment, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I like that your observations are local. You know, things that you're seeing around shows you're paying attention, which is good. So what I'm going to do is continue with the talk if there's no one else. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some of the things that have been popping up more on a global scale. So for example, how many times have you heard that this was the hottest June on record? There's 2019, 2020, 2021, right? And it goes back further. I just didn't want to clutter the screen here, right? There's a pattern that is emerging. And it's not just, it's hot and it's uncomfortable. I mean, there are consequences to some of these heat waves. People are dying. This, uh, this headline, the heat wave in 2021 is the deadliest weather related event in the state of Washington. This is from last week. A, one of the oldest giant sequoia groves burned. A lot of those sequoias are gone. This is from yesterday. Nearly one in three Americans experienced a weather disaster this summer. That's a lot of people. Sometimes I ask my students the question, how do you think climate change is going to impact you most directly? And something that gets overlooked a lot is food. This, this headline is showing that food supplies are being affected by the changes in the climate that we're seeing. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is going to go without food, but it means that where there is food, it's going to get more expensive. And that's where we're more likely to see that in places like Florida. Um, I want to highlight that part too. As food vulnerability rises, social unrest often follows. That's a pretty important and yet sometimes hidden factor. That's a consequence of climate change, which is why the U.S. Department of Defense classifies climate change as a national security concern. Because we're seeing around the world, as there are droughts and reduced food production, therefore reduced food, there's a rise in extremism. And this is something that cannot be overlooked. And honestly, it is a lot. It's tiring to, to see all this, but this is what's going on. So what is exactly is climate change? Well, before we define climate change, I have to define climate. Before I define climate, I have to define weather. So let's break it down. Not like that. 
Weather is the short-term condition of the local atmosphere. And there's a few things in that definition. The fact that it's short-term and atmosphere. So if you have spent any time in Florida, you know that weather can change pretty quickly. And it isn't very, very broad spread. Sometimes it can be raining here, but not in Apopka, for example, like on Port Eeyore there. I want to focus on the atmosphere, though. And this is a beautiful picture from the International Space Station showing a side view of our atmosphere. Uh, this is just before the sun rises, so the Earth is still in shadow, which is all the black part down there. Above that is the troposphere. Above that, the stratosphere, and then the mesosphere, and finally the thermosphere above that. So not only is this a nice picture to look at, it's actually showing us distinct layers of the Earth. Of these, I want to focus on the troposphere because that's where weather actually happens. That's the lowest layer, the one that we're in right now. And even though it is the lowest, thinnest layer, it is where about 75% of the total mass of the atmosphere is contained. And that's 99% of all water vapor and aerosols. So it's the lowest layer, but arguably the most important, at least to us. I found this really great visualization online that shows the state of Florida, happy coincidence, profiled against the Earth. So you kind of get a sense of how thin the atmosphere is. Right? So the troposphere is actually just that part there. It averages at about 11 kilometers in thickness. We have this tendency to look up at the sky and see no end to it, so it seems like it's massive. There is a lot of volume up there, but it's not that much, and this kind of underlies how fragile the atmospheric system is. I've also gone ahead and added where the International Space Station is, just as a fun fact, that's the average altitude. Um, not that high up. When we think of outer space, that's not what I'm thinking, personally, but it's pretty close. It, it would take you less time to drive to it if you could drive vertically than it would to drive down to Miami. So how far is 11 kilometers, the average thickness of the troposphere? Well, the distance from Valencia College West Campus to the Orange County Convention Center is exactly 11 kilometers. That is the thickness of this layer that we're talking about. This is where our climate happens. So again, I want to underscore that this is a fragile system. It's not very thick. And another fun fact, even though you can't see the boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere above it, you can indirectly see where it is whenever you see a big thunderstorm in the distance, because as those storm clouds rise, once they reach that boundary, they will flatten out. So that's where that boundary is. So neat little fun factory there. Okay, so let's talk about weather. Weather is driven by the sun, by the sun's energy, and is the result of three individual factors. Temperature, air pressure, and moisture. All three of those together give us our current weather at any given time. If you look at weather update, you'll see those three things highlighted. The temperature, humidity, which is the moisture, and air pressure. Weather is short-term and small scale. So again, it, as I said in Florida, it changes pretty quickly. So this is the outlook for one day, and we can see cloudy, thunderstorms, partly sunny. This is in the matter of hours. And as far as it being small scale, this is a weather map showing that it could be raining here and not there, as highlighted by these. Okay. And this is showing that there's significant fluctuations in the troposphere at any given time. But here's the thing. When you average out those fluctuations over a long term, you start to see a pattern emerge. It, it may rain today, it may be sunny tomorrow, but over a long scale of time, you can average those in and you start to get a bigger picture. This is the data for Orlando. If we scroll down and look at Tampa, it looks very similar. Include Miami, also looks similar. So what we're seeing is that these three areas, which at any given time could have pretty different weather conditions over long scales, have pretty much the same condition on average. And that's what climate is. Climate is the long-term averaging of these individual weather events. So when you group areas together by similar climates, you get things like this climate map, which is showing us areas that have common 
climate features over long terms. That's what climate is. So what is the deal with climate change? It can refer to two different things. When we talk about a changing climate, we can talk about how it varies naturally over long time scales or how it varies because of human activity. I want to go over the natural climate variability first to kind of define what that is and show later that what we're seeing now is not part of this system. Climate has varied significantly through Earth's history. For example, when the dinosaurs were around, it was much warmer on the planet than it is today. Uh, that's why insects were significantly bigger back then. Uh, there's a correlation between insect size and temperature. When woolly mammoths were around a couple of tens of thousands of years ago, it was much cooler than it is today. Uh, in fact, there were thousands of feet above Manhattan today. But why? Why does that happen? Since weather is driven by the sun, changes in Earth's orientation relative to the sun will have an effect on weather and therefore climate over the long term. The first reason is because Earth's axis of rotation is not fixed, is not constant. Currently, we're at about an inclination of 23 and a half degrees, which means that in this position, the Northern Hemisphere is getting more direct solar radiation than the Southern Hemisphere, so it's getting warmer in the top of this image and colder in the South. That translates to summer and winter, respectively. But what if the tilt increased? The Northern Hemisphere would be getting even more radiation and the Southern Hemisphere even less, so summers would be stronger, winters would be stronger. So when there's this gradual difference, the intensity of the seasons changes. And we know that Earth's axis rotation actually varies between 22.1 and 24 and a half degrees on a cycle of about 41,000 years. It also tends to wobble like when you spin a top and that wobble takes about 25,772 years, roughly, to complete. So those two together are going to affect how strong or weak we feel the seasons. On top of that, Earth's orbit around the sun is not fixed. It's not constant. So sometimes it's almost circular and sometimes it's much more elliptical. That's gonna affect how close or far we are from the sun. And it's, I wanna say it's not this drastic of a difference. I've exaggerated to illustrate the point but it does impact how much solar radiation we're receiving directly on the surface. So all of those together create a cycle. This image is showing us precession, obliquity, and eccentricity. Those are the three factors we just talked about. The degree of Earth's tilt, the wobble of it, and the shape of the orbit. At the bottom of this diagram, down here, that's the pattern that we see in the climate record. Sometimes it's much hotter, sometimes it's much colder, and it keeps looping. These are known as Milankovitch cycles. So if this is part of the natural system, what's all the fuss? What's everyone talking about? Well, this is that second way that climate can change. It's not the natural climate variability that seems to be the problem. It's when it's altered by human activity. And this is what's known as anthropogenic climate change. That's the term for human-caused changes to global climate. How does human activity affect global climate? Well, we've already seen some of it at the beginning. The alteration of land through deforestation and agriculture, those have real consequences to how the Earth atmosphere system interacts. These are these pictures from earlier. But the biggest factor we're seeing today is the emission of greenhouse gas. What is a greenhouse gas? It's any gas that absorbs heat and traps it. So when you compare a greenhouse gas, which in this example is in the jar on the left, that's carbon dioxide, and on the right is normal atmosphere, normal air, the greenhouse gas, when heated, stays hotter for longer. Those gases trap heat. So when those gases are in Earth's atmosphere, they make it so that the more of them there are, the hotter the atmosphere remains when it absorbs heat from the sun. And I, I wanna say that by themselves, greenhouse gases are not bad. We actually use them to not freeze to death at night, right? There is a natural balance to greenhouse gases, but typically speaking, the more of them there are, the hotter things stay. The five most abundant 
greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone. These exist in the atmosphere even without human interaction. The problem is that these two are increasing significantly because of human activity. So let's talk about that. Methane is mainly coming from agriculture. Cattle farming is the biggest contributor. Uh, cows produce a lot of methane when they digest. Um, I won't get into the details. If you're curious, ask the biology department about where that's coming from. But the population of cows is significantly increased from what would be in a natural system because of demand for beef. And that produces a measurable amount of methane that is entering the atmosphere. Also, rice farming. These rice paddies, which flood the land um, in order to grow the rice, they actually prevent oxygen from entering the soils it would normally and promote the growth of methane-emitting bacteria. So these two practices combined are putting a lot more methane in the atmosphere than would be their natural. Carbon dioxide is the bigger concern because that's coming from burning fossil fuels. So a fossil fuel is any energy resource made from the remains of ancient organisms. The three fossil fuels that we use are coal, petroleum, and natural gas. So how does burning fossil fuels release CO2? We're, we're told that it is, but what's the science behind it? It's actually really straightforward. When you burn something, that process is known as combustion. It's a chemical process that occurs when you burn. And most of the times it is an oxidation process. So when you burn organic matter, which is made of carbon because all life on earth is carbon based. So the remains of life on earth is also carbon based. You oxidize it, meaning you add oxygen atoms to it. So it's pretty straightforward that carbon plus oxygen, this is carbon dioxide. How much CO2 are we talking about though? Well, here's a graph of atmospheric carbon dioxide over the last 800,000 years. And you see a natural cyclicity to it. There's a natural variation, ups and downs. And then right around here, things make a dramatic turn. That's around the mid 1800s when that jump happens. You may be wondering, who was measuring carbon dioxide concentrations 800,000 years ago? It was not cavemen, although that would have been cool. We're getting this data from ice cores and tree rings. We can take direct measurements of these ancient atmospheric compositions from bubbles trapped in ice. And we can calculate the temperature based on the isotope ratios in those air bubbles, as well as in tree rings. And we can correlate the values just some pictures of what these ice cores look like. Uh, most of these are taken from Antarctica or Greenland. And those are the ice bubbles I'm talking about. And much like tree rings, you can actually see individual years in these cores. This is an example of one tree ring showing just how much information can be obtained, how much data is in it. Right? Each of those rings can tell us information from the year in which it formed. So, that's how we're getting this. I just wanted to give you the background of how we're getting this data. And this is not from one ice core or one tree ring. This is from hundreds of each of them. So how is that carbon dioxide affecting temperature? Well, here's temperature reconstruction from the year 200 to now. Again, you see highs and lows. Sometimes seasons are a little hotter, sometimes a little cooler. But again, once you get to the 1800s, there's a dramatic jump. And that jump does not reflect what is happening in the rest of that record. And that's a pretty good indicator that it is not part of the natural system. So what happened in the 1800s? That would be the Industrial Revolution. When we started using these fossil fuels in significant quantities, Humans have been using fossil fuels for a long time. You can use coal to, to stay warm. You can use it in a fireplace or to cook. Uh, the ancient Greeks used petroleum as weapons. They would light it on fire and throw it at other ships. Uh, but it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that we started using these 
in factories and plants 24 hours a day for transportation, right? All of this adds up. So our energy needs are directly responsible for the amount of fossil fuels that are being consumed right now. That's the big takeaway from those graphs. This, this is called an energy flow diagram and it looks pretty busy, um, but it's, there's two things I wanna point out here. The left column is showing how much energy we're getting from each of these resources in the United States. And this is for the year 2020. This is the most recent diagram. Um, every major energy resource is listed there, solar, nuclear, hydroelectric, wind, et cetera. But the three highest, unsurprisingly, are the fossil fuels. Natural gas is 31.5%, coal is 9.21%, and petroleum 32.2%. Most of the petroleum is being used for transportation, like cars that use gasoline, trucks that use diesel, airplanes that use aviation fuel. Um, some of it is being used for electricity generation. Coal and natural gas are almost entirely for electricity generation. And the cool thing about the diagram is you can see that. You can see where these resources are being used. Now, I also want to point out something I think just as alarming in this diagram, and that's on the right side, rejected energy. Rejected energy is a fancy term for wasted energy. Now, wasted energy, energy doesn't mean that you walked into the kitchen, turned on the light, and then you left without turning the light off. I mean, you should turn the light off just to conserve power and save money, but that light bulb is still doing what it was designed to do. So that's not considered wasted energy. Wasted energy is usually in the form of heat. That light bulb gets hot. The back of your TV gets hot. The back of the refrigerator gets hot. That heat is being produced by the electricity and it's not really being used for anything. It's a byproduct. So of all the energy we're using, and this is, again, this is just for the US, just under two thirds of it is actually not being used for anything productive. That's just a, that's a reflection of the inefficiency of our technology. And I, I think that's a bit alarming that more than half of our energy requirements don't actually need to be there. So a quick review time. Burning fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide. That's fact. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Fact. And greenhouse gases make the atmosphere hotter. Also fact. Put those together, our use of fossil fuels has been affecting the atmosphere to the point that we are suffering from the consequences, have been suffering, and will continue to. And something has to be done about it. I want to take this opportunity to dispel some myths because, you know, sometimes things you hear online aren't true. I know, surprising. The first, and you don't, you don't really hear this one too often anymore. Climate change isn't real. I think everyone has put this one down and we can establish that it is false. Uh, I'll refer you back to this diagram. This on the right side of that curve is not part of the natural system. But I have been hearing a, a variation. So let's call this one myth 1A. People use winter weather as well, proof, unquote, that global warming, that climate change is not happening. And these are some recent headlines. There's a big snowstorm coming to the Rockies, either today or tomorrow. Um, there was a major snowstorm that derailed a marathon in Utah. So sometimes people see this and think, oh, well, with these kinds of blizzards, there's no such thing as climate change, but that's also false. Climate change does not mean that every day is going to be hotter than the same date last year. It doesn't mean that you know, June 6th is going to be hotter in 2021 than in 2020. It might be, but it doesn't mean exactly that. It means that there will be more instability, both hot and cold weather will be more extreme but the average temperatures will be warm. So what does that look like? This really nice bell curve is showing us temperature distribution compared to the amount of days per year. And this is for the, for the date range from 1951 to 1980. You can see that in the middle of this, where average normal temperatures are, is where the most number of days per year happen. And that's to be expected. Extreme hot and extreme cold days 
are by far fewer in numbers. There's only a couple of days per year that are really, really hot or really, really cold. But look what happens from 1983 to 1993. The curve has shifted slightly and the height of the bell curve is actually reduced. 1994 to 2004, 2005 to 2015, and this is the most recent data we have. The old curve is still there in gray. The current curve is over here. Notice that there are a lot more extremely hot days, but also there are more extremely cold days on this side. And this is what we're seeing when we see these crazy blizzards. It's not that this isn't happening, it's that it is part of the pattern. We're going to see more extreme cold days, but we're gonna see a lot more extreme hot days. And overall, this is where the average is now. There's gonna be less average days than there were before. And the average temperature has increased. So overall, the entire system has warmed up, even if a few days are gonna be colder than before. Myth number two. This is a new problem. We didn't know this was happening. This one is also false. I don't mean to point fingers, but here's a 1982 internal study from Exxon. And one of the things that their scientists did was plot out a curve predicting how CO2 would increase in the future and how temperature would rise as a response to that. And if you look at where 2021 is, their prediction was a concentration of CO2 at about 421 parts per million and about a one degree increase in temperature. The real data is 414 parts per million currently and a 0.8 degree increase. That's a pretty good prediction. Just as a scientist, I, I respect the, the quality of the work they did, um, I, even if it is alarming and a shame that this was hidden. But the, the point of this is to show that we've known about this for a long time. This problem has been something that we've been aware of. Myth number three, this is one that I hear a lot. Well, the world would be warming anyway, with or without us. What tells us that's false. I will refer you back to this diagram again and notice what's happening before that big jump. There's actually a cooling trend that was happening before the industrial revolution. Remember natural climate variability. The earth goes through hot and cold phases. The data indicates we're actually in one of the cooling phases. And as part of the natural system, the world is supposed to be getting cooler. There were several famines in Europe several hundred years ago caused by abnormally cold weather. We are technically in an ice age right now because that's defined as anytime there's ice permanently on earth's surface. So Antarctica and Greenland have permanent ice year round for now. So the data tells us we should be cooling, and yet what we're doing is warming drastically. So no, what we're seeing now is not part of the natural cycle. Myth number four, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Is this one false? I wanna do breakout rooms again, and I want to hear some suggestions uh, because Quite honestly, this talk has been pretty depressing so far. So I'd like to hear some positivity, some hope. And never know, we might get some really good ideas. So let's break everyone up. All right, welcome back, everyone. What inspirational ideas did you all come up with? Stephanie, raise your hand. Uh, yes, sir. My group, we talked about creating awareness. The more people we can take and help them learn about more, especially what's actually happening, it can help little by little um, get people more into it and have a more, more big impact. And we can do it by also like social media. It's been a like a really big outlook of to get people more like involved in everything. Absolutely. Awareness is really important. That's kind of why we're doing this, right? Um, as far as social media, uh, sustainability, our sustainability group is on Instagram. If you don't follow them already, you should do so. Um, who else? 
Kevin, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Matthew. Hi there, Kevin. I, in my group, we spoke and talked about um, the numerous sustainable initiatives that are being performed right now in our community. Uh, I have a few courses that we have um, some research on sustainable initiatives and through Carrie's help and Professor Ray and other individuals, it's amazing how many initiatives are happening right now through the city, the county, the school districts, and even at Valencia. So uh, the comment we shared was to just continue to support and participate in these initiatives that are happening now. Great, yeah, it's, I'm sometimes surprised when I see all these measures we're taking. And unfortunately, the surprise comes from a long time of inaction. So you're absolutely right that it is inspiring to see so many people are now really taking this seriously. Um, anyone else have something they'd like to add? Just want to give a shout out to Critical Mass in Orlando, which is a bike riding group once a month to give awareness for bike safety and also to use your bicycle more as a mode of transportation. And, uh, and we really ought to, we have a lot more bike paths and um, we should be using our bicycles more often in, in the localized area where we live if we can. We had critical mass down in Miami. Any other ideas, suggestions, even if they're lofty? else all right so i'll go back to sharing my screen okay so after all of those downers what's the good news well one it has already been touched on there is a lot more awareness and recognition of the this is something that for a long time, a lot of people were uncertain if, if there was an issue or outright saying there was no issue. I think most people are on board now that there is a problem and something needs to be done about it. It's getting much harder to ignore. Uh, the Nobel Prize last week, Nobel Prize in physics was for climate science. So the three scientists that were awarded the Nobel Prize all do research into climate, both modeling climate systems and studying the effects between and atmosphere. So that's really, that's a big deal. Um, also, I found this uh, a couple of weeks ago. The current prototype for the largest carbon capture plant officially opened in Iceland. This is a plant that pulls carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and traps it. So if these things become functional enough that they can spread and be mass produced around the world, that's one way to start reducing some of the damage that's been done. Now, I'm not saying undo the damage that's been done. That's not realistic, but we can maybe slow down damage and prevent this from getting really bad in the future. Right. And I, I just, technologically, that's, that's awesome that they've figured out ways to sequester the CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, and the best part, this is powered through renewable energy because Iceland has a lot of the geothermal energy, so it's not even using fossil fuels to power it. It's 100% clean in that regard. Okay. Now, what does sustainable development say about what we can do? Okay. Well, we go back to the Brumman Commission. Kind of going full circle here. Oops. Um, society must set and meet goals to ensure we can meet our needs without inhibiting society from doing the same in the future. That's paraphrasing the earlier quote. So, Again, we can't pretend that we don't have to meet our needs now, but we have to figure out ways to do that without damaging ourselves in the future. Um, one focus that has happened recently is we've moved away from this transgenerational concept. It's no longer about helping future generations. We have to help ourselves now. So this is now intergenerational. We really don't have the luxury of waiting and then hoping to set up goals that our descendants can take care of. We, we have to really do this ourselves. So earlier, I mentioned the uh, three Ps of the triple bottom dollar concept. 
this is focusing on people, which is social equity, fair labor, and business practices, and making sure that resources are available to all. Planet, environmental sustainability, uh, reduction of pollution and destruction, and profit. This is kind of the important one because really all things tie back to money. And in order for these things to take hold, they have to be profitable. There are lots of companies that I'm sure would love to be sustainable, but investors, stockholders, whoever, won't let that happen if they're not making profit. But if we start finding out what, or figuring out ways to make these measures profitable, then we're onto something. So applying those, people, individual and communities, uh, individual and community needs support in these ideals. What we can do with the planet side, we, you've all heard reduce, reuse, and recycle. Right? So that has a real impact. Um, it may seem kind of when you're putting a bottle, a plastic bottle in a recycling bin versus a garbage bin, out of sight, out of mind, you stop seeing it, it's, it's gone. But it does actually help because every bottle that is recycled is one that is not using new petroleum to be made. And profit, this goes back to what I was just saying. We have to make sure that these measures are profitable. And one way of doing that is by you supporting them, right? So last week I had to buy mouthwash. And I saw a bunch of bottles on the shelves. One bottle said it was made from recycled plastic. Guess which one I bought? So the business is seeing that, okay, these products are selling. And that's, that goes in line with the profitability side. There's also been one addition to the triple bottom, which is culture. There needs to be a cultural shift for these impacts to take place. Right. And part of that is awareness. We need to spread the knowledge and the realization that this is something real, something that has to be addressed right away. Right. And that, that's in some ways the hardest part. It's a cultural shift that needs to occur across the planet. One way to do that, actually, I think it was Stephanie that was saying it, social media, going to sustainability conferences like this one, right? Things like that add up. So that's it for me. Thank you. Now we can break it down. Are there any questions? I want to read Andy Ray's comment that sustainable development recycled building materials prefabrication with minimal waste and locally sourced materials, fire resistant mass timber construction. It's my colleague in architecture. Um, concrete is another one that's a, a big one that we're trying to get away from. Absolutely. Uh, they've actually been developing concretes that as they cure, absorb CO2 as part of the process, which is neat, but that's a one-time process. So once it settles in, it's done, but it's still better than traditional concrete. Greg wants to know if we have time to talk nuclear. Uh, sure, nuclear is scary for a lot of people, but that fear is mostly unjustified. Um, the, the times that nuclear energy has gone wrong tends to attract a lot of attention. Chernobyl, right? But Chernobyl is a good example of how you don't run a nuclear power plant. Um, in the U.S., our nuclear energy has a really good track record uh, that I'm aware of. Only Three Mile Island has had an incident, and even then, I don't think anybody was injured from that. It, the, the reactor that failed was contained, and we're good. Um, the only problem with nuclear is the waste product. What do you do with those rods once they stop being efficient enough to power the plant, but are still radioactive for another 100,000 years? That's the, the real big drawback with uh, nuclear energy. But environmentally, aside from the waste, I mean, you know, aside from highly radioactive material, uh, it's pretty clean. It only produces water vapor. Um, again, big asterisk on that part, aside from the nuclear waste. Some people have proposed launching nuclear waste into the sun. I'm not a huge fan of that idea, but it's out there. Any other questions? don't see any. So um, we are going to do a quick little wrap up here. I just want to say a huge thank you to Prof 
Professor Chow for this great presentation. Oh my goodness. Um, what a great overview of sustainability and explanation. And then um, I appreciate you going into the myths and debunking them and, um, and sharing the facts behind them. So thank you so much for, for your presentation and thank you to all of our attendees for today.